So our text this morning is Exodus 8 and verses uh, 1 through 15. And so let's uh, give our attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word from Exodus 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers over the canals and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs may be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs, as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as the Lord has said. And thus far the reading of God's holy word, and may he have blessed our hearts now this morning. When it comes to frogs, we probably have uh, different thoughts, but generally speaking, most of us probably don't have much fear of frogs. A couple of years ago when my family was on vacation and we were at my cousin's house in Missouri, One of my children and I spent some time on a paddle boat trying to catch frogs, and it was a lot of fun, but you would never find me catching spiders or scorpions or snakes with any of my children, let alone anyone. Also, when we think of frogs, we might think of some famous fictional frogs. So, for example, Kermit the Frog is probably the most famous, right? Or you might think of Frog and Toad, the main characters in a series of children's books. Or you might think of the fairy tale of the princess and the frog, where the princess is to kiss a frog and turn him into a prince. Or today there's the company Leapfrog, which creates educational toys and games and videos for children and has a few frog cartoon characters. Uh, Frogs can also be quite colorful and beautiful. Uh, For example, Uh, last time we were in California, my wife and I went to the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, and one of the things we saw there was just all kinds of beautiful frogs, all different colors. Frogs also make all kinds of sounds that are rather humorous. So frogs are not that scary. Some are beautiful, and they make for rather cute cartoon characters. So when we come to the second plague, it can almost seem anticlimactic after the first plague, In the first plague, we saw that God turned the Nile River and pretty much all the water in Egypt into blood. There was blood everywhere. It would have been miserable. And so how will God top this? Frogs. Well, at first glance, it may not seem that bad, but as we'll see when we look a little more closely, it was indeed a a judgment on the Pharaoh and the Egyptians that laid them low. As Psalm 78 puts it, he sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. So this was indeed a judgment, a just judgment and a punishing plague. 
And so let's uh, look at it a little bit more closely, the second plague here of frogs, frogs, and more frogs. And we'll see three things here. First, uh, a persistent demand. Secondly, a punishing plague. And then thirdly, a prayer for deliverance. A persistent demand, a punishing plague, and a prayer for deliverance. First, we have here a persistent demand. Last time, we saw that the Lord told Moses uh, to meet Pharaoh at the Nile River. This time he tells him to go to him in his palace. And this is part of the pattern we will see with the three groups of three plagues. You may remember I mentioned that last week, that there's an order, a pattern to these plagues. There's 10 of them, but with the nine, the 10th is the climactic one, but with the nine, there's three groups of three. And in the first of each triad, Moses meets Pharaoh at the Nile River, so plagues one, four, and seven. In the second of each triad, Moses goes to Pharaoh in his palace, plagues two, five, and eight. And in the third plague in each triad, three, six, and nine, the plague comes upon Egypt suddenly without any warning. And so this pattern that we see with the plagues once again shows that none of this is random acts of nature but the hand of God's providence ruling over nature, judging His enemies, and redeeming His people. Next, we see that the Lord comes again with a very specific demand of Pharaoh. He says in verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. You see, God's demands don't change. He continues to demand that Pharaoh let his people go so that they may worship and serve Him, the one true God alone. God's demands are non-negotiable, and as one commentator notes, what was true for Pharaoh during the Exodus is true for sinners in salvation. God's terms remain unchanged. What God demands today is the same thing He demanded in the time of the apostles. When people asked what they had to do to be saved, the apostles said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God still requires sinners to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ, we should not expect Him to make us another offer. Jesus Christ is God's best and only bargain for eternity. And so the Lord's demand of Pharaoh is the same. Let my people go that they may serve me. And the demand today is the same for all who might Know the Lord and His salvation. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as we saw with the first plague, we, we see a warning given before the plague comes. Uh, the Lord doesn't have to give any warning, but we see that the Lord is patient and slow to anger here, and so He gives time. He gives warnings in, in seven out of ten of these plagues. And of course, he gave an overall warning before any of them started with the sign of Aaron's staff in the form of a serpent that swallowed up all the magician's staffs. And so too, if you haven't yet trusted in Christ alone for salvation, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day where you are being warned of the coming judgment, a final eternal judgment when Christ returns. Don't wait another day. Because as Paul put it in 1 Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. And so like the first and second plague, now is the day of warning. Now is the day of salvation. Repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Don't put it off another day. But this warning in our passage also reveals that the coming plague will intensify things somewhat in that Pharaoh won't be able to escape this one. You may remember that with the last plague, Pharaoh just, he just returned into his palace, kind of annoyed that he couldn't take his bath. Well, all his people suffered and had to dig to try to find water. So he just went back inside, and no doubt he had servants tending to all his needs and making the, the first plague not that bad for him as it was for his people. But now with the second plague, there is no escape for Pharaoh, notice. These frogs, are, it says, are even going to come on his own body. 
He's not going to be able to escape this plague at all. And yet we see once again that this warning of the Lord is spurned. The assumption of the text is that Pharaoh again hardens his heart and doesn't heed the Lord's warning. And so God is again justly judging the Pharaoh who is without excuse. And so too, there is no excuse today for those who refuse to repent and believe in Jesus. Uh, Romans 1 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see, there was no excuse for Pharaoh. He had all the evidence and warnings that he needed. Yet he spurned them all, and even more, there is no excuse today for those who refuse to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. God has given ample evidence in the creation of the world that He exists, and even more, He's raised Jesus from the dead, His Son. As Acts 17 says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed the day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. And so once again, repent and believe in Jesus Christ this day and you will be saved. We see here a persistent demand. And secondly, we see here a punishing plague. Now just a few general comments about the plagues before we look more specifically at the second plague. Notice here that this is a plague in verse 2. Now that might seem obvious. You could probably have figured that out on your own. But this is the uh, first time that the Bible uses the word plague here like this. Typically, the Bible refers to these plagues as signs and wonders, as there are miracles that point to theological truths about God and about His judgment and salvation. But, but plague is also a fitting word, as a plague is a, a blow or a wound or a great distress of some kind. And God said that He would strike Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and He does strike them. He strikes them with these plagues. Now this plague and all the plagues are supernatural acts. And this may be obvious to us, perhaps I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but in our day and age where often miracles are rejected, it's good for us to think about this. Some try to argue for naturalistic explanations of these plagues. For example, the first plague, some say it was another case of the Nile uh, flooding its banks, which was an annual thing. And uh, they say that it picked up red dirt along the way, making it look like blood. But that doesn't explain the fact that blood was everywhere in Egypt, as we saw. And some say that this uh, second plague was also naturalistic, and that due to the first plague, all the frogs would have left the Nile because it was uninhabitable for them. But that too is unpersuasive and that this was not just frogs leaving the river, but a miraculous multiplication of frogs like they had never seen before. And furthermore, the frogs aren't just camped out on the Nile riverbanks. They infest the whole land. They're in every crook and cranny in Egypt. And the rest of the Bible speaks of this and the plagues as supernatural acts. Psalm 78, I said earlier, says this, He sent among them frogs which destroyed them. He sent these frogs. This is a supernatural act, and all the plagues are. Also, with the plagues, there's a lot of creation language. Uh, multiplying and swarming and teeming is creational language from Genesis 1. Only what we see with the plagues is a reversal of the good order of creation. In Genesis 1, things go from chaos to order. Here with the plagues, things go from order to chaos. 
In Genesis 1, humanity is to have dominion over the animal kingdom, but now the animal kingdom is being turned against humanity. As one commentator put it, this is God's measured unleashing of anti-creation forces on the helpless Egyptians. The teeming of God's creatures was originally something good, something that exhibited God's creative work, but now this chaotic teeming mass of frogs is a destructive abundance. And so the plagues show that God rules over creation and can unleash His creation on humanity at any moment. And this second plague in particular is both horrible and humorous. It's horrible in that it wasn't a pretty or pleasant thing to experience, to go through. But it's also humorous for God's people to read about. I mean, if you heard in the news that the most powerful nation in the world today had some kind of crisis on their hands, this is the last thing you would expect, a frog problem. So there's definitely some humor in this narrative, a a holy mocking of sorts. Again, as Psalm 2 puts it, the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs at those who challenge His authority and power. So it's both horrible and humorous, but just try to imagine it for a moment. Frogs have come up out of all the rivers, all the canals, and all the pools in Egypt. And frogs are now everywhere in the land. You can't escape them. You go in your bedroom to wind down at night, and you have to walk through a sea of frogs, trying, trying desperately not to squish any of them. And maybe then you hope to climb into your bed where they might not be, but in ancient Egypt, they didn't have elevated beds like we do today. Their beds were pretty much just mattresses on the floor. And so you pull back your covers, not to find just one frog, but 20 frogs. And you get up the next day to make coffee and a few frogs rib it in your coffee tin and hop out. You go to fire up your oven for a meal and you smell frogs roasting. In your sock drawer, on your couch, in your children's toys, in your infant's crib, frogs are everywhere. You go to use the toilet and frogs jump out. You go to take a shower and reach for the shampoo bottle and you grab a bullfrog. Your wallpaper is toads and frogs. Some are green, some are brown, some are purple, some are black with red spots and others are yellow with black spots. And they all stare back at you with their beady little eyes. Not only would it have been a major nuisance, it also would have been a disaster for the environment. It would have been unsanitary for the preparation of food. And whenever they died, it would have left a terrible stench. On top, of it all, on top of it all, it would have been super noisy to have a, a choir of frogs constantly. Frogs chirp, croak, ribbit, cluck, grunt, and bark. A choir of frogs would be a horrible noise pollution. You wouldn't get a second of silence to hear your thoughts. Some of us like sleeping with a sound machine and even might enjoy the, the sounds of the rainforest. But this would be overwhelming. This would be too much. This would deprive one of a good night's sleep. And again, this is not just a problem for the poor in Egypt. These frogs are in every nook and cranny in Egypt, including the Pharaoh's own home and even on his own body. Nobody can escape this plague. And so it's both horrible and humorous. But why frogs? We have to ask again, why frogs? And again, this isn't random. This plague is an attack on Egypt's gods. Last week we saw that the first plague especially targeted Happy, the Egyptian god of the Nile. Here now we see the Lord attacking Hecate. Hecate Hecate was depicted as having a, a female body with a frog's head. She was the spouse of the creator god Knum. And it's believed that Knum fashioned human bodies out of clay on his potter's wheel. And then Hecate breathe the breath of life into them. She was also believed to be the goddess of fertility and was thought to assist women in childbirth. She also had the responsibility of controlling the frog population in ancient Egypt and protecting the frog-eating crocodiles. And so this plague is a sign that Hecate is truly nothing. Yahweh is the one true God who creates, who breathes the breath of life into His creatures, who is the God of fertility causing frogs and all creatures to multiply, just as He caused the Israelites to multiply next to this one. The God of Israel is God alone, and He has no rivals. 
And so like the plague before this, there's more significance to it than it just being a, a hardship. It's a sign that the Lord rules over the gods of Egypt, which are really just counterfeit deities. And He will unleash all the forces of creation to drive home that point, even if He has to do that with frogs. But as we've also seen, behind the idols are demons. We saw this in our First Corinthians series in First Corinthians 8, but I read it again this past week in Psalm 106 where it says that they served their idols which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. And so these plagues also prove that Satan is no match for Yahweh our God. As Martin Luther once put it, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And so as we meditate on this plague, let us once again put all our trust in God alone, not in idols. Your only security and satisfaction and salvation comes from God and God alone. Turn more and more from the idols of your hearts. Turn from covetousness, which Paul says in Colossians 3 is idolatry. Turn from the idol of sex and pleasure. Turn from the idol of the praise of man. Turn from the idol of money and comfort, earthly comfort. Turn from the idol of a a spouse, whether married or single. Turn from the idol of children, whether you have them or not. Turn from the idol of government and politics. Turn from the idol of social media. Turn from the idol of TV and video games. Turn from the idol of self. You see, anything can be an idol, even good things when they become ultimate things. But let us once again turn from our idols this day and by God's grace worship and serve the one true God who alone can save us from all our sins, who alone can satisfy all our desires and ultimately secure for us an eternal future of blessing. And so, we see here a persistent demand and a punishing plague, but third, then notice a prayer for deliverance. In verse 7, we read that the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Now again, this is most likely uh, sorcery, demonic, Uh, and this will be the last time they're able to mimic anything, as we'll see with the next plague, eventually they say that's it. They tap out. But again, they just, they just add to the plague. <laughs> they can do nothing to reverse the plague of frogs. And so the Pharaoh isn't too impressed with his magicians this time. You know, the last thing Pharaoh wants here is more frogs. He wanted the frogs to go away. And so he's starting to have doubts about his magician's powers and, his, and Hecate's power. And so surprisingly, He calls Moses and Aaron back to his palace to share a prayer request with them. Notice verse 8, plead with Yahweh to take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to Yahweh. Now, this is remarkable. Uh, Earlier, Pharaoh mockingly asked, who is Yahweh? But here, he uses the divine name and begs Moses and Aaron to plead with Yahweh He knows that this plague was a miracle of the Lord and that only the Lord can reverse it. But this isn't so much true spirituality as it is superstition. This is common with unbelievers when they are in great distress, isn't it? Perhaps on their deathbed and they they call for a minister to pray for them, thinking, you know, it can't hurt. Also, like Pharaoh, many will promise God anything when they are in real trouble but it's all just superstition. And we see here with Pharaoh that it's possible to know about the one true God and not know Him truly. It's possible to know that only God can save and not know Him as your only Savior. And it's one thing to ask others to pray for you. It's another thing to pray to God yourself. Pharaoh doesn't pray to God himself. What he should have done is pray to God himself, and not simply that he would take away the frogs, but that he would take away his sin, that he would take away his cold, dead 
heart of stone. As Charles Spurgeon once put it, Pharaoh's prayer dealt only with the punishment. Take away the frogs, take away the frogs, take away the frogs. That is his one cry. So we hear the sick exclaim, O oh, sir, pray that I may get well. The drunkard begs that he may be helped out of his poverty. The impenitent sinner cries, pray that my child may not be taken from me. It is not wrong to pray, take away the frogs. We should all have prayed so if we had been surrounded by such pests. The evil is that this was the whole of his prayer. He said not, take away my sins, but take away the frogs. He did not cry, Lord, take away my heart of stone, but only take away the frogs. You see, sin is our ultimate problem. A plague is a just judgment because of sins. And the good news is that if you pray to God yourself and ask God to take away your sins, He will once and for all remove the guilt of all your sins and remove more and more over time the corruption that remains until finally you're free from sin forever in heaven. As 1 John 1 promises us, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our sins and transgressions from us. That's the good news. And so do you pray to God personally? Do you cry out to Him in prayer? Or are you like Pharaoh here who doesn't have a prayer of his own? Pray to God. Cry out to Him through faith in Christ, then He will hear you. And the most important prayer that you'll ever pray for, to God is for Him to save you from your sins. And if you've prayed that, you can be sure that God answers it. He's answered it once and for all through His Son, Jesus Christ, who saves you from all your sins. Well, even though Pharaoh's prayer request didn't arise out of true faith, but more from superstition, nevertheless, we, we see here that it's okay to pray for unbelievers. God is pleased to use our prayers to, to bless unbelievers so that they might know the one true God who hears and answers prayer. As Moses puts it in verse 10, notice, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And so Moses responds to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. He says, Pharaoh, tell me when and I'll pray and you watch. As soon as I pray, God will hear and answer. And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. And you might be wondering, why didn't he say today? And I'm sure all the Egyptians are wondering, why didn't he say today? <laughs> why tomorrow? Well, perhaps he thinks it will take a day to get Yahweh's attention or that it will take 24 hours for Yahweh to reverse this plague. Either way, Moses allows Pharaoh to pick the time. Why? So that it's plain and obvious, you can't miss it, that Yahweh exists, that Yahweh alone is God, and that Yahweh rules over creation and judges His enemies and redeems His people. And so the next day, Moses cried out to God about the frogs. And we read in verse 13 that the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Now there's uh, at least three things we're noting about these verses here. First, be encouraged that God hears and answers the prayers of His people. He hears your cries, beloved. He's not indifferent. He's not too busy. He is your heavenly Father. He is your heavenly Father. As we heard in 1 Peter 5, let us humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's a reference to the Exodus. For He cares for you. He hears your cries and, and, and He will answer your prayers. He will answer the prayers of His children and come to their rescue according to His perfect will and perfect timing for His glory and the good of His children. Secondly, this too is a miracle. You know, it's one thing to open Pandora's box to let all the frogs out. It's another thing to put them all back in the box. This too is a miracle, 
that just like that, the frogs are dead. And third, we see here that this plague isn't entirely over yet. (laughs) With one loud ribbit, all the frogs croaked. And the Lord's, at the Lord's command, they instantly died, and now Egypt is on cleanup duty. And again, it's both horrible and humorous, because now when you go to bed, you find 15 dead frogs. Now when you go into your pantry, you find dead frogs in your flour, your sugar, your coffee grinds. Everywhere you go in your house, you smell the foul stench of frogs. And with the heat of the Egyptian sun, Beating down on these dead frogs, just imagine how bad it was. And there's no air conditioning. This was surely a foul odor. Earlier, the Israelites complained to Moses that he had made them stink in the eyes of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Well, now we see the same word again. Only now it's Egypt who stinks before God. And now they have to shovel all these dead frogs back to the Nile or wherever they were to dispose of them. And after studying this passage, I will never again complain about shoveling snow. Just imagine all the snow we've gotten this winter. And just imagine that it was all dead frogs that didn't just melt away, that you actually had to cart off somewhere with the rest of the city and province to dispose of. It would have been miserable And nevertheless, as we see in verse 15, the Pharaoh denies his sense of smell, he hardens his heart, he reneges on his vow, and does not let the people go, as we see over and over again in this story. As soon as the frogs are gone, it's like out of sight and out of mind. But beloved, let that not be true of us. If if you've been, been praying to God to deliver you from some affliction of your own, whether it's bad health or a long winter or some other financial distress or any other kind of distress, and He answers your prayer, let us thank Him in prayer. Let us respond with prayers of thanksgiving when God delivers us from any afflictions and with grateful obedience to His Word. Let us praise Him in the assembly of God's people and above all for our deliverance in Christ. Because above all, God has revealed Himself to us in His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who came to deliver us from all our sins and misery. Jesus is the one who never bowed a knee to an idol. Jesus is the one who conquered Satan for us once and for all. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for all our sins of idolatry. Jesus became a plague for us on the cross. Our sins were placed on Him, and He bore the wrath of God that we deserved. He suffered more than the Egyptians suffered in all the plagues combined as He suffered hell on the cross. And now Jesus has risen from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God where He rules over all things for the sake of His church. And so let us put all our trust and hope in Jesus Christ alone and thank God for our deliverance in Him. Beloved, no matter what you see on the news... Jesus reigns. No matter what happens in your life, Jesus, your Savior, reigns. No matter what you feel, Jesus, your Savior, reigns. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's our Almighty God and our merciful Savior. And so let us put all our trust and hope in Jesus and live lives of gratitude. For one day He will come again and right every wrong and judge all of His and our enemies. In fact, we see in Revelation 16 that the plagues in Exodus foreshadow a much greater judgment to come. In Revelation 16, we see that unclean spirits, it says, emerge as frogs from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in order to deceive world rulers with delusions of victory over the Lord and His anointed, and to assemble them for their final defeat and destruction. And they will be defeated by our divine warrior King Jesus and thrown into the eternal lake of fire. But for all who call upon the name of Jesus for salvation and trust in Him, it will be our ultimate deliverance where He will wipe away all tears from our eyes and there will be no more sin or sorrow or suffering. Death itself will be swallowed up in victory, in the victory of Christ. And so let us rest, beloved, this day in the complete salvation and victory of Christ and let us share this hope 
with others. And may God's name be glorified in our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, and we praise your mighty and powerful name as we see your power over all of creation. And we praise you, and we also praise you that you have not punished us as our sins deserve, but that you have provided salvation through the precious blood of your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the deliverance that we have in Him. And forgive us for our sins of idolatry this day. Help us to turn from them more and more out of gratitude for so great a salvation. And help us to worship you. Help us to magnify you in our life. Help us to thank you in prayer and to pray for others and and to also share this hope with others. We pray that you would save those who don't know you, especially our lost loved ones, that you'd open their hearts to believe as we point them to Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.